Ned, we're all fascinated with consciousness, and we think we're conscious. But let's step back, and I want to ask you as a philosopher, if, if, if I just asked you, what kind of things are conscious? How do we begin to address this question? Well, let me distinguish between two issues, two big, important issues. One is the issue of looking at biological creatures, looking at the phylogenetic scale from the more primitive uh, up to us. Um, where do we draw the line? So we're sure that we're conscious. Um, we're sure that higher primates are conscious. Well, not everybody is sure of that. Not everybody is sure. Well, some people, when they talk about consciousness, they mean something to do with language. Okay. Whereas what I mean is the kind of basic phenomenal consciousness, the kind of consciousness that goes with experience, that is experience. So I think we, we're, we're sure that higher primates all have that experience. Uh, they all have color vision. Um, when they look at a, a red thing, it looks a certain way, different from the way a green thing looks. I don't think we have any doubt about that. Um, they're visual. The visual system of all, um, um, all old world primates anyway, like us, works in pretty much the same way. Okay. We study the macaque a monkey um, uh, by way of studying us. The visual systems are so similar. I think the, the possi even though they're not language-using creatures, the likelihood that they don't have visual phenomenology, like our technicolor phenomenology, the likelihood of that is negligible. Okay. Um, so, but there is an issue once we get into lower creatures where they stop having um, that kind of phenomenology. So, you know, does a, a mouse have it? Does a lizard have it? And it's especially problematic when you think about animals with very different brain organizations like birds or the octopus. So that is one problem. How do we apply the notions that we get from the biology of human consciousness to other creatures that have brains quite different from ours? Uh, and, and as you get down on the phylogenetic scale, you're getting eventually to do creatures that don't have brains. They're single cells or right. cells yeah. that clump together in some yeah. way and the rudimentary sense organs and you yeah. know, reactions to the environment and by some right. chemicals. And you, right. know, you can see they're reacting. They, they yeah. Some chemical they'll go the other way from. They'll have an aversion reaction. I mean, yeah. are they conscious of that reaction? It's a yeah. single cell. I'm sure they're not, but uh, we don't really have the machinery from the study of... Uh, of primates to answer that question. But I think I, I'm confident, or not, maybe not conf, maybe confident is the wrong word, but uh, um, I, I'm hopeful that we will one day have a metric based on the creatures that we understand that we can apply to other biological creatures. Okay. So that's one area. Is, that's is, one area. Okay. The much harder difficulty, in fact, it's what I call the harder problem of consciousness, what to say about silicon robots and creatures that are really very different from, from us, where the metric based on our biology may not apply to them at all. So when we deal with the non-biological intelligence, these robots, we have to imagine it on a much bigger scale than it is today, that the, the doubling of, of technology exponentially, you can see in a very few decades, uh, whether it's three or four decades or, or, or uh, 10 decades soon, the processing power of robots will be significantly more than the human brain itself. Uh, massive parallel systems, et cetera. So we have to imagine these robots in a very different way, but that's coming soon, so your question's valid. Well, I think it's coming. I'm not sure how soon. Um, you know, um, in the 1960s, Marvin Minsky said that all we needed to solve the problem of machine intelligence was a few graduate students and a, you know, a fair bit of money. Right. Um, <laughs> and that's turned out not to be true. The problem of making intelligent, behaving machines has turned out to be vastly difficult, vastly more difficult than anybody thought. Pigeons can do things that no machine can do. A pigeon, for example, can distinguish between a picture that contains a part of a person or a person from pictures that don't. No machine can do that yet. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure how soon it's coming, but I think it's coming eventually. It has to be eventually. So eventually we'll have behaving machines, and we'll have to decide what to say about them. Um, you know, philosophers distinguish between the hard problem of consciousness and the harder problem. The hard problem is... Uh, why the material basis of a given conscious state is the material basis of that state as opposed to another one or none at all. The harder problem is how to apply concepts based on the, um, the, neur uh, the, the neural underpinnings of human or, or mammalian um, um, consciousness to other creatures that aren't 
like us mm. in those ways. And I think it's going to be an extremely difficult problem to know how to do it. The, in the trial of Commander Data in the second Star Trek <laughs> series, they, um, uh, this robot is, um, 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 uh, is uh, uh, on trial to see whether he's conscious is yeah. what it comes down to. And they end up making their decision on moral grounds um, arguing that basically what it comes down to is in case he's conscious, we better not take him apart. <laughs> and we may be in that position ourselves. All right, so what we've now discussed is, is three kinds of, uh, of substrates. The, the human, which we immediately dismissed as really not an issue because we really believe we are conscious. And even mm -hmm. though I know I'm conscious, I'm pretty much sure you are through, through analogy, although I can't prove it. We did that. Then we talked about in the animal world, the phylogenetic scale or where it might be. And right. now the much more difficult question of the non-biological world and what the future will come. There's a fourth category that some philosophers would put forth. Yeah. And that is that everything is conscious. Yeah. So-called panpsychism, yeah. which uh, is... Uh, so, some people may think is animism and very uh, primitive, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a maybe even growing group of philosophers who yeah. really want to take this seriously. Yeah. They're so disturbed about consciousness yeah. as an issue that they're willing to go to panpsychism. Yeah. Well, Everything is conscious. You are suggesting, and I agree, that it's a council of despair. <laughs> if you don't understand consciousness or how to, you don't understand it scientifically or even how to understand it scientifically, it is, does make sense to try wacky, wild, and crazy things. But this is so wacky, wild, and crazy to think you know, that molecules think, are, are, are they, conscious. They don't think it's despair. They think it's, it's, it's enlivening. They think it's a, it, it's a new way of sensing reality. And they're very, actually quite thrilled about it. I think it's a crazy speculation that has nothing going for it except that it's so crazy that maybe we need to try something so crazy in order to make some progress. Other than that, I can't see much in it.